What exactly is scoliosis? Well, scoliosis is technically defined by a lateral bending of the spine of at least 10 degrees with rotation, and both of those have to be present. If we don't have any rotation along with lateral bending, that's not really scoliosis. And if we don't have at least 10 degrees of lateral bending, when measured on an x-ray using what's known as Cobb method of measurement, that's technically not scoliosis. So we need to have lateral bending of at least 10 degrees with rotation for scoliosis to be present. Now in a normal spine, your spine should be straight when viewed from the front. And when viewed from the side, you should have a curve in the neck, the cervical spine, the thoracic spine, and the lumbar spine. In scoliosis, what happens is the spine actually twists and rotates, creating a rotation and a lateral bending when you view that from the front. How is scoliosis classified? Well, there's a few different ways you can classify scoliosis. The most common is by its cause. So when we think about the causes, there's idiopathic scoliosis, which means we don't know the exact cause, and over 80% of all scoliosis are idiopathic scoliosis. A congenital scoliosis. A congenital scoliosis is a scoliosis or deformity that someone is born with. It can be when you have a hemivertebrae, where a vertebrae didn't form 100%, where it's misshaped. It can be where you have blocked vertebrae, where you have several vertebrae that are fused together, typically on one side, causing a um, curvature of the spine. So that's a congenital scoliosis. You can have a neuromuscular scoliosis, which is a scoliosis that is secondary to a, mu uh, a neuromuscular condition. That could be um, a tumor along the spinal cord. It could be muscular dystrophy. It could be cerebral palsy. Those are all well-known or documented types of neuromuscular scoliosis. It could be a degenerative scoliosis, where the spine actually breaks down and degenerates. This is what we typically see in adults. Now in adults, you could have an idiopathic scoliosis that developed when someone was younger that becomes a degenerative scoliosis, or you could have what's called a de novo scoliosis, which is the new scoliosis that develops in adulthood, and is typically caused by the disc start to break down and degenerate along with the facets, and as the spine starts to break down and twist and bend and rotate, you get more or you get more uneven pressure on the spine, which causes further degeneration and the spine continues to progress. Another way you can categorize scoliosis is by the location. For example, you could have a cervical scoliosis, you could have a cervical thoracic, thoracic scoliosis, thoracic lumbar scoliosis, or lumbar scoliosis. So we also classify scoliosis based on its location. Another way we classify or we name scoliosis is by if whether what side of the spine, if it's a left or right. So a left scoliosis is called a levoscoliosis, and then if the spine curves to the right, that would be known as a dextroscoliosis. So technically we would classify a scoliosis based off of the cause, but then we also um, label them or subclassify them based on the location, left or right, or you know, like where they're actually at within the spine. Now, a couple types of scoliosis are one, when we have a C-shaped scoliosis, where you generally have one lateral bending of a scoliosis. A lot of times, a C-shaped scoliosis will also accompany a big lateral shift of the spine. This is very common when we have neuromuscular scoliosis or scoliosis that's secondary to connective tissue disorders but it can happen in other types as well. Or you could have an S-shape, an S-shaped scoliosis where you have one curve in one part of the spine and then you have the opposite curve in another area of the spine. So the two big ones when you have a C or when you have an S-shaped scoliosis. What are some of the most common signs and symptoms of scoliosis? So first of all, we would consider it a sign if it's something that you visually see. So if you're looking for scoliosis, some of the most common signs are one, uneven shoulder. Two, when you have a prominent shoulder blade or a shoulder blade sticking out on one side. Three, when you have 
rib humping when someone bends over, especially in the thoracic spine, you're gonna see a rib humping. And sometimes you can even see some humping in the lumbar spine. Four, when you have asymmetrical waist. If you have a scoliosis in the lumbar spine, and let's say on my body, if there was a left scoliosis, you would see a flattening on the left side, and you would see an increased curve on the right side. Another thing you can look for is uneven pelvis or hips, where one leg will appear to be lower or shorter on one side, and the other side seems longer. Those are very common signs of scoliosis. Some of the common symptoms are one, pain. Now, a lot of times when you have adolescent scoliosis, they don't have real severe pain, it's more of a dull ache, but a lot of times pain can be present, but it doesn't have to be. In adults, a lot of times pain is the first symptom of scoliosis, especially if someone's unaware they have scoliosis, having pain is a lot of times that was what triggers someone to go see, be seen by a physician, where the scoliosis is detected as the actual primary cause of that scoliosis. In more severe cases, sometimes difficulty breathing can be a, a symptom of scoliosis. But difficulty breathing is typically only associated with people that have more severe curves in the thoracic spine or the body starts to collapse. We're talking when curves get over 70 degrees to 80 degrees. That's typically the range where someone starts to start having difficulty with breathing. Well, who is at risk of developing scoliosis? So women or females are typically more likely to develop scoliosis than males. Now, when someone's an infant, you know, in the first one to three years of life or juvenile from age four to 10, a lot of times that's more balanced between um, boys and girls. But once we hit puberty where we get teenagers known as juveniles, it's much more common in females to develop scoliosis. Also, in adults, scoliosis in females is more common because one, you could have a scoliosis that was present when someone was a teenager that is still present in adulthood, or you could have a degenerative scoliosis that develops in adulthood. And this, a lot of times, the degenerative scoliosis a lot of times progress or begin around that menopause area. So most scoliosis are more common in, in females. Um, at certain ages, it's kind of mixed, and then. A lot of times, if you have a scoliosis in a male, there's a higher risk of a pathology causing that. Scoliosis that's caused by other conditions, such as a soft tissue disorder or congenital, those are more evenly balanced as far as if you have it more in males or females. People that have a family history of scoliosis are more likely to get scoliosis. We don't, when we think about idiopathic, we don't know exactly what's causing it, but we do know that it looks like there is a genetic factor um, involved. And so there's likely some genetic things involved along with some environmental triggers that can, that can you know, uh, cause a scoliosis. So people that have scoliosis in their family are more likely to develop scoliosis. So we talked about a lot of things that can cause scoliosis and how we classify it, but how do we detect or diagnose scoliosis in the first place? Well, it all starts with a physical exam by a trained specialist. And what a specialist is going to look at, they're going to look at your overall body appearance from the outside. They're going to look for shoulders being unlevel, they'll look for that shoulder blade sticking out, they'll look for rib humping when you bend over or any major asymmetries. The test we do for screening is called a forward Adams bending test which is where you put your hands together like this and you lean forward and then a provider will use something called a scoli meter and put and run this along your spine and it actually measure, measures for rotation because as I mentioned if the spine rotates that's what actually is causing scoliosis and when we get over a certain amount of rotation that's an indication that there's likely scoliosis so typically if there's more than six to seven degrees of rotation in the thoracic spine or you have more than four to five degrees of rotation in the lumbar spine, that's a strong indicator that there's rotation and there's a high likelihood of scoliosis. Now, the gold standard is to use x-rays. And on x-rays, we actually measure what's called the Cobb angle, where we actually will measure the vertebrae that's most tilted above compared to the vertebrae most tilted below. And then where those intersect, we measure an angle and we will measure a Cobb angle. And as I mentioned there, if there's at least 10 degrees of lateral bending with rotation, then technically we have a diagnosis of 
scoliosis. Now there are other imaging tools we can use to further evaluate scoliosis, but they're not necessarily ones we've used to diagnose them. Um, a CT scan is a great way to get a 3D image where we can look at the amount of rotation and a, and a CT scan is probably the best imaging available to show the amount of spine deformity and asymmetry in the vertebrae themselves. So what are the potential side effects if someone has a scoliosis and it gets untreated? So one, it's possible someone could have a scoliosis and it doesn't become a bigger issue, it, it's stable and it doesn't become painful or progressive surgery. But a lot of curves can progress and when they progress, especially when we see scleral scoliosis, when some, like an early onset scoliosis or when someone's a teenager and adolescent, the big concern is it progressing to surgical levels. So a lot of treatment's done to prevent it from becoming surgical. Another one is pain. It, is, it has been shown in the scientific literature that people that have scoliosis have a higher incidence of pain than people that don't. And especially considering someone may not have pain at all or not have a severe pain when someone is younger, those curves can become more painful and frequently become more painful in adulthood. Another one is degeneration. Basically, when you have asymmetries of the spine, you have part of the spinal joints and the discs that have more pressure and tension and compression on them compared to the other part. And that unbalanced compression will cause the areas of the spine that have more pressure on them to break down and decay. And as this happens, arthritis begins and you start to get degeneration in the spine itself. But probably the most um, concerning thing for most people is how they physically look, their overall appearance. It's how their, their asymmetries um, is the biggest concern. So a lot of our treatments are designed to prevent it from having becoming surgery and to decrease pain. But for patients, a lot of times, the biggest concern is how they physically look. So how do we actually treat scoliosis? Well, there's different levels of treatment. Anywhere from observation, where we're just frequently evaluating to see how the curve progresses and to see if other interventions are needed, all the way to complete spinal fusion. And a lot of it depends on one, what the patient wants, and two, what's most appropriate. And a lot of times there's a range of what's an appropriate treatment. So observation, typically someone, this is what we do in either children, um, juveniles, or adolescents where we're evaluating the spine every three to six months, taking an x-ray every six months to monitor that curve and see how it's progressing. Once curves get about 20 degrees and sometimes even smaller, that's when we definitely want to do active treatment. So that can be scoliosis specific exercises, things like shroth, C's, and then more frequently scoli balance. Those are like basically physical therapy specific for scoliosis. And then bracing. Bracing is kind of the gold standard non-surgical treatment for scoliosis, but there's lots of different types of braces and they don't have the same effectiveness. They work, they work differently and they have different goals. And then there is surgery. And surgery has both non-fusion surgeries using something called like tethering, or you can have a fusion where you actually fuse vertebrae together. So the treatments can range from observation all the way to complete spinal um, fusion. And a lot of times, depending on the severity of the curve, the age of skeletal maturity, and then also what the patient wants to do is how we determine what's the best and most appropriate treatment.